Ok, lepo pozdravljeni, good afternoon everyone. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to open the very first uh, academic forum of uh, this academic year at the new university here in Ljubljana. Uh, my name is uh, Matej Albal. I'm a professor of uh, European law and director of the new university and I will be your host uh, today at the academic forum dedicated to the European constitutional heritage. As you already know, the, this academic forum is taking place uh, within the ambit of a broader uh, project uh, financed and supported by the Slovenian uh, Research uh, Agency uh, and dedicated to the development of an integral theory of the future of the European Union. Um, the future of the European Union is at the moment a very topical uh, issue. Uh, it is not just uh, a subject matter that would be relevant for academic uh, research, but it also has uh, a very big uh, political resonance uh, because for several months now uh, in Brussels and all around Europe, uh, a widespread popular discussion and political discussion within the political establishments, both national and supranational, a discussion has been going on on the paths that the European continent, and in particular the European Union, should take in the future. And we here at the new university, uh, today together in cooperation with the Polish uh, embassy, have thought that uh, when we are reflecting about the future, it is also important uh, to be aware of the past. And therefore, we have, to date it to, we have dedicated today's academic forum, uh, as already indicated, to the issue of European constitutional heritage. If we are looking forward to the development of European constitutionalism in the future, if maybe even a new European constitutional treaty could emerge in the following months or years uh, out of these debates in the European Union, it is quintessential to understand how European constitutionalism has developed, how it has unfolded in various member states. And today we have two member states that will be at the core, at the heart of our discussion. On the one hand side, there will be Poland, and on the other hand, there will be uh, Slovenia. Both of these countries are celebrating important landmarks uh, this year. Poland is remembering its constitution of 3rd of May from 1791, which means there has been, there has been more than 200, there has been exactly 230 years when this Polish-Lithuanian constitution was uh, adopted. And Slovenia, as you know, and this is probably much uh, better known, Slovenia this year is celebrating the 30th anniversary of its own first independent and democratic uh, constitution. It is my great honor uh, to host today three excellent uh, speakers who will help me to explore together with the audience uh, the, the question of European constitutional heritage uh, by looking at the Polish uh, experiences and the Slovenian experiences. For the Polish side, uh, we have invited uh, His Excellency uh, Krzysztof uh, Olenski, who is a Polish ambassador uh, to Slovenia. Very warm welcome. And an, exp and an expert in, um, in history, and especially Polish uh, history, Professor Richard Batterwick Pawlikowski, who is a professor at the University College uh, London, as well as at the College of Europe in, in, uh, in Natolin, uh, Warsaw. And our third speaker uh, will be Professor Peter Jambrek, uh, who is, among many other things, uh, a president of the new university, but who is also someone who can be easily and rightfully considered as the founding father of the Slovenian uh, constitution. A very warm welcome uh, to all three uh, speakers. Um, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Uh, we have decided uh, that we will uh, first pass the floor to, to His Excellency. Uh, because your excellency, you have to leave us in about 10 minutes for another important meeting, for another, for an opening of another uh, important meeting. And therefore, I would like you to invite you first to say a couple of words 
on the importance of the European uh, constitutional heritage, on the Polish uh, experiences, you yourself being a historian. So I would be really like to hear uh, from your side about this uh, very important subject matter. And then I will invite two other speakers that are today with us. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Aubain, for, for this uh, very warm welcome. And thank you very much, Professor Butterwick and Professor Jambrek, uh, for uh, joining us here for, for, for this uh, debate. In fact, it's a very important uh, debate for, for, for our time, for our days. Uh, first of all, uh, explaining the roots of European constitutionalism. Uh, explaining, the, I mean, how much constitutions are important for a political culture of different nations. Uh, in fact, uh, looking back in the history of Poland, uh, constitution and the, the Bill of Rights uh, was the, not only the, the, I mean, most important document, but it was also the, the, the kind of the, the, of the cornerstone for a society and for a state, for ancient Poland and for a modern Poland. So when we are looking back, uh, for sure, we must think about the tradition, about the tradition, uh, how the rights were established and how the uh, rulers uh, were settled on, on their, uh, in their rules. So both Slovenia and Poland, we are having a more or less common heritage. It's so-called Knezny Kamen. And the, uh, the way in which the, in, a, in a very ancient times, so the, the, the seventh, the eighth centuries, uh, the rulers of the Slavic tribes were elected and how those societies uh, were seeing their liberties, they were seeing the way of the auto government. So uh, when we are passing uh, forward, we are realizing that in the first century in Poland, we uh, are starting the, to experiment with the new the type of state. The state created not by the rulers as of uh, dominus naturalis, the, the herders, those who were owning the state, but first of all, by those who were equals, those who were forming estates. So nobility, uh, then uh, citizens, uh, so inhabitants of the, of the cities, and then also peasants. And in Poland, this, uh, I mean, formation of the states is the middle of the, of the 40th century. And the uh, rules which were established at that time uh, created the conditions for the uh, further, for the further uh, uh, rights. And among them, the most important is uh, the bill which was uh, established, which was uh, proclaimed in 1433, uh, uh, first 1430, uh, and then 1433, uh, the bill that no, uh, which said that no one uh, be, be arrested uh, without the court verdict. So, neminem captivavius nisi jure victor. And it entered into vigor just immediately after being pro pro proclaimed the second time in the 1433. So in comparison uh, with the Magna Carta from 1250, uh, this, uh, I mean, um, this law was immediately in vigor. While in the Great Britain, uh, in England, uh, Professor Butterick, please correct me if I am not uh, right, uh, the, the Magna Carta was fully invigorated only in the, in, the, in the 17th century. So uh, it needed at least, uh, I mean, some hundred years uh, to fully implement this, this law. But the rule that, uh, that no one uh, uh, should be arrested uh, without the, 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 the court verdict, the court mandate, I mean, it's, it's absolutely foundation not only for the for the past Poland, but all, but it's also a foundation for the current Poland, and it's the absolutely foundation for the uh, political uh, culture uh, of Poland. 
The, the, the second element that I would like to, to, to mention uh, is also a very important step, step ahead in the forming of the Polish constitutional uh, tradition and also European constitutional uh, tradition is the uh, constitution uh, of uh, 1505 uh, called Nihil Novi. And it was uh, uh, translated that, that nothing about us without us. In this sense, citizens of the Kingdom of Poland and Grand Duchy of, of Lithuania, uh, they were, they were, they were uh, uh, establishing the, the fundamental rule that no one uh, can decide without our consent. And uh, that's the, the memory about this constitution of Nikhil Novi from the 1505 is it's lying uh, in the bottom of the political decisions that are uh, taken right now, today. So we were entering into the European Union being convinced that after this moment, no one should decide upon us without our consensus. And it's absolutely, absolutely clear, not only to Polish politicians, but to every Polish citizen. And here, it's another element here which should be added before we will pass to the constitution of the 1791. So uh, as the constitution of the 1573, the first, the act of the Confederation of Warsaw, where every citizen, so nobility, decided for their religion tolerance. So no one was persecuted because of its or her religious convictions. And it was first act of the time, which is exemplary also for today. And together with this, with this uh, act of the Warsaw Confederation, we are having another, another very important, uh, another very important, uh, another very important uh, act that's the uh, Henrician Articles or the Articles of the King uh, Henry, which were uh, the group of uh, regulations, group of law, which was a kind of the constitution, which after the King uh, Henry de Valois, which became the, the King of Poland and the great Dutch of, uh, of, of Lithuania, every king should swear before taking the power. And one of the most important elements of it, it was that uh, no one, any person who was becoming the king of Poland should create a dynasty. So it means that, I mean, the, 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 the full power for deciding about the state about the nation was in the hands of a nation. So the nation was a sovereign. And when this idea finally arrived to the uh, so-called Western Europe after the French Revolution, it was uh, before the cornerstone of, of Polish, uh, of Polish uh, law, it was the cornerstone of the Polish state. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Your, Your Excellency, uh, for this uh, introduction, uh, for drawing our attention to the uh, Polish uh, contribution, uh, medieval even contribution to, uh, to the uh, roots of modern uh, constitutionalism. Uh, you have emphasized certain important concepts that are um, still alive and kicking and, pre and present the core of modern constitutionalism, such as the idea of the habeas corpus, uh, the idea of individuals' uh, autonomy, the idea of cell determination of individuals, of, uh, indeed of, of, of peoples, uh, the idea of freedom of, of conscience, the idea of um, uh, freedom of religion. These are all uh, important values 
uh, and principles that, that have had a long period of gestation uh, across basically 1,000 years uh, here uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, by drawing our attention to the Polish experience, uh, you have also enabled us to, to learn something, something new. And for me, I have to say, and I am, uh, I consider myself to be a constitutional lawyer, trained uh, in the field of constitutional law. I have to say that little did I know about the next subject that I will invite uh, Professor uh, Richard Butterfick uh, Pavlikowski uh, to discuss, and that is the Constitution of the 3rd of May, uh, 1791. Uh, Professor Butterfick, uh, you have written this uh, excellent, very informative, uh, extremely well-written, um, even if a tiny book about this Constitution. Uh, I'm sure, uh, since I was almost completely ignorant about those developments at that time, I would like to invite you now uh, for the next uh, 10 minutes to speak to us uh, about these uh, constitutional uh, developments. How did they get, how did they, uh, get, into, get into being? What were the historical uh, reasons? What was the outcome uh, of those developments then? And then in the second round, as I already uh, indicated uh, in our trial session, uh, we will move to the implications of maybe of, of that constitution of that time still to the, uh, on the pre for the present uh, times. So, uh, Professor uh, Batowick Pawlikowski, the floor is yours, is yours. You're warmly invited to say something about uh, your excellent book. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rector, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, and thank you to His Excellency the Ambassador for enabling me uh, to speak to all our listeners uh, today. It's a, it's a great privilege and a pleasure. Now, both you and the Ambassador uh, highlighted the interaction of old and new in the constitutional tradition of Central Europe. Now, I'll have the opportunity to say more about why that's important uh, in the second round. For the moment, I would like to sort of pick up where the ambassador left off and emphasize the antiquity uh, of the Polish-Lithuanian constitutional tradition and also it links to the classical Republican tradition of ancient Greece and Rome, uh, which was rediscovered and uh, sort of reworked uh, during the Renaissance. And because the constitution of the 3rd of May, 1791 was on the one hand, a forward looking uh, document with a new social and political vision for the 19th century. And I'll say more about that later. And on the other hand, it was seeking to repair and restore parts of the Polish-Lithuanian constitutional tradition, which had fallen into neglect or, dis uh, or, or, or disrepair, uh, and therefore needed to be uh, smartened up. In the older Polish uh, constitutional tradition, we have a neo-Aristotelian idea of the mixed form of government. We have projected onto the institutions and social realities of 16th, 17th uh, century Poland-Lithuania, the idea that the polity, the commonwealth, the res publica, uh, dedicated to the public good, can best function if there is a mixture uh, between a form of government where one person holds power, that is a monarchy, a form of government where the best few people hold power, an aristocracy, and a form of government where many people hold power, in other words, a, a democracy. Because left to themselves, monarchy will decline into tyranny, aristocracy will degenerate into oligarchy, and democracy will end up as ochlocracy or mob rule. So it's very hard, but also very necessary to maintain a balance uh, between uh, those forces. Other, it's important that the majesty represented by the king is moderated by the liberty represented by the mass of the citizens as a whole, and vice versa. And often the aristocratic senate is seeing as playing that balancing role. 
But on the other hand, the senators themselves can be accused of degenerating and becoming overmighty citizens and oligarchs. Well, that more or less fits the institutions of the Commonwealth, providing we accept that the very numerous nobility, as much as somewhere between five and seven and a half percent of the population, uh, was in fact the democratic element. Now, of course, we can say, what about the peasants who constituted 80% of the population? But then shouldn't we apply the same kind of criteria to ancient Athens or ancient Rome with their very large populations uh, of slaves? And the lot of a peasant in the Commonwealth in the 16th, 17th century was not the same as that of a slave. Anyway, the Commonwealth fell into crisis, its balance was upset, it lost its de facto sovereignty and became a sphere of influence of the Russian Empire by the beginning of the 20th century. And during a long period of peace, on the one hand, you have some fairly anarchic politics in which nothing seems to be able to happen because of the effects of the rule of unanimity, the liberal veto. Uh, within Parliament, and also the very limited prerogatives of the monarchy. But peace brings prosperity. Prosperity helps to bring cultural, educational, and intellectual revival. And by 1788, there comes an opportunity with the Russian Empire preoccupied by war against the Ottoman Empire in alliance with the, with the Habsburg monarchy, and the encouraged by Prussia, which of course has its own agenda, the parliament or same of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth throws off the Russian guarantee of its institutions and starts to decide about the Commonwealth's politics as a sovereign political body, very much applying that principle that the ambassador mentions, Nihil Nove, which can also be put as nothing concerning us without us, needs on us, uh, bez nas. And this results in a revolution in political culture, uh, a pamphlet explosion, published speeches, published sermons, people from outside the nobility taking an interest in politics as well, a very great interest in politics uh, uh, and influence exercised by aristocratic women uh, as well. Uh, and this parliament manages to triple the revenue, quadruple the army, establish institutions of local government. But it's very difficult to find the consensus uh, on the form of government. I should say that this parliament can take decisions by majority vote because of the institution of the Confederacy, a kind of state of emergency when the rule of unanimity is set up line. This parliament is held under the auspices of a confederacy, or so it's a confederated same. Finally, there's a compromise between the king and the leaders of the more enlightened, the more inform reformist part of the opposition, and together they negotiate uh, the, uh, the form of government. I'd just like to share a screen, if I may, uh, to show you the scene on the 3rd of May, uh, 17, uh, um, 1791. Now, where's the, uh, the share screen button? I'm not sure that I can uh, uh, manage that. Um, no, I'm afraid I, oh, here it is at the bottom. There. Can you ever see that everyone? That gives you a, a, a sense of, the, of what was happening on the 3rd of May, 1791 in the Polish Lithuanian parliament. And on the right is the official diary of that session. Now this was not a regular parliamentary procedure. Uh, there was a fear that of obstruction, the use of procedures, uh, that the uh, agents of foreign powers would get involved. So uh, about a hundred or so parliamentarians were left 
led into the secret. And then there was this reading out to great enthusiasm, both from parliamentarians and from the public. And towards the end of the day, after long debates, there was a serious debate on this. Uh, it was acclaimed by the swearing of an oath. And this is the moment that's presented in this drawing. And then two days later, the procedure was legalized. Uh, there was a unanimous resolution that what had been done two, year, two days earlier was in fact the will of the nation. And even some of those who had protested two days earlier now accept it. So if the revolution was of dubious legality on the 3rd of May, it was made legal on the 5th of May. Now, regarding the content of this law, which was called the law or the statute on government, uh, later on it was referred to as a constitution. Uh, a constitution in traditional parlance was a word for a law or a statute. But from then onwards, it was also used to refer to a constitution in the modern sense of the world. Uh, it was deliberately con compared with the American constitution, which had been passed uh, uh, for uh, uh, two to four years uh, earlier. So in that sense, it was a constitution in the old sense of the word and a modern sense of the word. And this was a solemn fundamental law that set out the chief institutions of government. And it also set out citizens' relationship to those institutions of government. And the whole was based on the values shared by the political community. So I certainly regard this very much as a constitution. It is relatively short. It is 3,700 words long uh, in Polish, uh, and it is a wonderful piece of political rhetoric. There is a great deal of didactic and persuasive explanation in the text. Uh, it uses the opportunity to advance a much more open vision of the nation than before. Uh, there is a preamble which justifies the extraordinary means needed to introduce the constitution. Uh, there is an uh, article on religion, which on the one hand establishes or maintains Roman Catholicism as the dominant national religion. And yet it also gives full freedom of worship to all people of all faiths, not only those churches or other uh, confessions which had previously been tolerated, but full freedom and full protection of the law and government to all people of all faiths. That is in itself extremely inclusive. And then there are three articles on the social structure. It's still a traditional social structure. There's an article on the nobility, an article on the townspeople or burghers, and an article on the peasants. But nobility is associated in particular with an idea of civil freedom. Uh, linked to property, uh, linked to freedom from interference from government, uh, which seems to anticipate liberal ideas. Uh, the burghers have already, in fact, been taken into the political community by a law passed a few uh, days earlier. That is confirmed. But most interestingly, the peasants are explicitly declared to be the most numerous and the most useful part of the nation. Now, this had hardly been acknowledged before, the idea that peasants might be part of the same nation as the nobility. And because freedom will be available to every immigrant, including people who are returning to the Commonwealth, there is a way out of circle. Then we have the heart of the Constitution, Articles 5 to 8. Five manages to blend the principle of the sovereignty of the nation with the separation and the tripartition of powers. And it's followed by separate articles on the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. On the legislature, perhaps the key innovation is that the members of parliament are representatives of the entire nation in the British fashion, not bound by their instructions as delegates of their lands. Uh, with regards to the executive, we have the introduction of a hereditary monarchy, although in practice that doesn't work out so well. Uh, we have, in general, the idea of a stronger executive headed by the monarch in partnership with a stronger parliament, which will be deciding by majority vote, not by unanimity. 
And with regard to the judiciary, we have the principle of elective judges, but also those very high standards of no uh, uh, arrest without trial and so on. There are a few more articles in the Constitution, and then there is a declaratory uh, statement at the end, which provides for its implementation. Uh, but overall, I think we have a felicitous blending of the inheritance of the past uh, with the idea of the, the mixed form of government, uh, with the influence of Montesquieu and Rousseau and the British parliamentary example, and for reasons I'll explain in the, uh, the next time I'm asked to speak, I believe that this was pointing the way towards a very much better 19th century than the one which in fact happened. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Batavik uh, Pawlikowski, for this uh, extremely interesting presentation about the, uh, the Constitution, which is uh, unfortunately not, not um, known uh, enough. Uh, also, thank you for depicting the spirit of, of time. Of course, this constitution was born in a particular moment of time, in a particular geostrategic situation, but the, the kind of a constitutional spirit has been on the rise. You, you mentioned the, the American experience. Of course, there was also the, uh, the French Revolution. And it is, it is important to know that uh, this particular piece of uh, constitution making, the, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, is thus um, an example of one of the oldest modern uh, constitutions uh, in, in, in Europe, at indeed in the Western uh, hemisphere. Professor de Ambrek, um, 200 years later, uh, you, 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 you collaborated on a project uh, which has drawn, which has had uh, uh, to a certain extent, uh, a privilege of drawing uh, on all these achievements of modern constitutionalism uh, taking place already 200 years ago. But at the same time, it is true, especially we, as, as you also were ex, uh, explaining uh, in detail in the, in, when you commented on the preamble to the Slovenian constitution in the, in the commentary on the Slovenian uh, constitution that was uh, issued by the, by the new university. Uh, it is also clear that um, tanks are actually due to the, not tanks, but due to the um, totalitarian communist uh, legacy uh, in, in, in Slovenia, this development, uh, also the constitutional development that was taking place on the contemporary uh, Slovenian territory was somehow lost. Uh, and to a certain extent, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the, in the times uh, when you were with your colleagues working on a new Slovenian uh, constitution, you had to establish the connection back uh, prior to the time when that uh, Leninist constitution was imposed on, uh, on, uh, on Slovenia. So tell us a little bit more uh, how you had conceived of your endeavors at the time, what were uh, difficulties and what was the, the constitutional heritage that you relied upon in drafting the, Slo the contemporary Slovenian uh, constitution? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rector. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm confused. I, I even don't think that the ensuing debate uh, should be or is doomed to be chaotic. Uh, let us try to see uh, what could be common grounds of a discussion between a professional historian, a diplomat, and the two of us who are actually students of uh, present day constitutions the European constitutions, Slovenian constitution in specific. And uh, well, that's why I, I'm, I'm afraid and I apologize, my introductory words will be a little bit confused as well. Uh, well, uh, it was mentioned uh, and I'm very well aware of the magnificent history of the Polish Lithuanian constitutionalism. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the 3rd of May, Polish-Lithuanian constitution of the two nations uh, never really got into practice, uh, never was implemented as a working practical constitution, which would uh, be the highest rule uh, of, of the empire. Uh, and in this sense, uh, I would assume it would 
be similar to something that we call in Slovenia the writer's constitution. The writer's constitution uh, was written in the year 1987, and it was pronounced in a public gathering uh, in April 1988. And please note that this date uh, precedes the fall of the Berlin Wall by almost two years, a little bit less. Uh, so the idea of the writer's constitution written by uh, half a dozen uh, of uh, authors, uh, two of us were lawyers, the rest were poets, uh, literary critics, uh, philosophers, uh, writers. And what we have done at that time was just uh, an intellectual uh, exercise. We, we never thought that uh, a constitution which we aimed to draft would take place as a, as a practical valid uh, law in the Republic of Slovenia. Uh, in, at that time, we were still firmly integrated into Yugoslavia, the communist state. And uh, what our aim was to mock the, the, the then valid uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, constitution, which uh, regulated uh, political, social, and all other kinds of human relationships within the communist state of Yugoslavia. Uh, the, the Yugoslav and the, the Slovenian constitution of that time was a very lengthy document, a, a heavy book with hundreds and hundreds of articles written in a non-comprehensible vocabulary, uh, very heavily uh, emphasized by the ideological, political, programmatic, and so forth, non-legal terms. So what we did uh, in 87 until April 88 was uh, an attempt to write a short, clear, uh, precise legal documents following the Western uh, European constitutional heritage uh, and principles. So the constitution defined uh, the rights and freedoms of citizens and foreigners following the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, it uh, regulated the uh, main institutions of the state following the German examples uh, and also constituted a court which should secure the implementation of constitution forever. So uh, here it was a short, clear, uh, simple text uh, which was promulgated with no intention of, uh, or, or even no hopes to, to be implemented uh, in practice. Anyway, we didn't know that, but a year and a half, two years af after that, the Berlin Wall fell, the Soviet empire imploded, and uh, Slovenia, Slovenia found itself within a uh, disintegrating Yugoslavia, seeking for an independent state, sovereign uh, state uh, of, of the Slovenian nation. Okay, in April 1990, there were the first free fair elections uh, to the parliament of Slovenia. And there, the, the democratic forces, the new parties formed uh, in an improvised way uh, a year ago before the elections, uh, won the elections and their only uh, promise to the voters was to constitute a new sovereign state of the Slovenian nation, founded and following 
the constitutional principles of the writer's constitution, which was at, at, in, at the hands. So, so to our surprise, the history was, uh, was very, uh, I would say, forthcoming to us. And what we, were, we have written as, a, as an intellectual ec exercise to, to mock the, the regime uh, became and is nowadays the liberal Slovenian constitution in power. Uh, well, just to uh, uh, remind us of the main thrust of, of the new constitution, the writer's constitution, is to dethronize, to, to, to put, put down from the throne the majesty, the majesty of the Communist Party. Uh, and give power to the people. So in this sense, the feudal communist system of, of, of a monarch, uh, a party elite, which was considered vanguard in all other senses, uh, was uh, lost its throne uh, to the advantage of, of the people. Well, you, you mentioned very generously the, not the Slovenian, but, but pre, the Carantanian uh, example from the 11th century, uh, a ritual or ceremony whereby uh, a, a new uh, ruler of, of this ancient Carantanian state, presumably also Slovenian, I, I don't know to what degree it was really Slovenian and to what degree it was a mixture of all kinds of Slavic, uh, and uh, indigenous tribes inhabited this territory uh, was uh, really uh, described in accuracy as, as it really happened. Uh, what is, what is uh, maybe interesting is that there are references to this uh, uh, consent given by the people of Carantania to the new ruler uh, the mention of Jean Bondin of this ceremony in his six uh, livres de la République, read probably also by Th Thomas Jefferson, uh, who uh, presumably was inspired by this idea of sovereignty of people, uh, le legitimizing the new ruler of, of the country. Uh, well, if, if, if it, it's there any historian value, historic value to this event uh, that happened in 11th century, uh, it's uh, excellent for our self-esteem in Slovenia, uh, and it, it is also uh, most likely uh, enhancing the self-esteem of the Polish people to, 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 to have drafted the second uh, modern constitution of the world, probably also the first modern constitution in Europe. Uh, if we disregard a, a local, I think Corsican uh, constitution that, that may disputably be the first one. Uh, but anyway, uh, what uh, I think we can learn from these historic experiences and actually, uh, Professor Aul and myself are not really, are very, very lay historians. Uh, but we, we acknowledge, I, I would imagine, uh, the value of history in uh, understanding how modern present day constitutions work in everyday life. And here, uh, let me point very briefly, but not to, to, to lecture on the topic, on the relationship between the European Union law and the national constitutional law. And here, Mr. Butterwick, we, you are the first one to call upon you to, 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 to give us a non-historian constitutional view on the Polish constitutional tribunal's judgment of, uh, I think, 11th of October uh, this year. Which, which is very well known, very well reported upon. And it's a privilege that Professor Auberman and myself differ 
in our academic evaluation and understanding of the Polish, of the Polish judgment. Uh, so uh, you see, but to 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 take into account history and reflect uh, upon the Polish October twenty one judgment in, in the view of the history, the history of Carantania from eleventh century, the history of the of the Polish Lithuanian uh, constitution of two nations uh, uh, in. Uh, 17, the, uh, I, I'm sorry to have skipped my uh, memory the, the exact year, uh, but uh, I would say that here it would be interesting to compare European Union constitutionalism with American constitutionalism. The United States is a federation. In a way, it's a unitary state. Its federal government is very well embedded, uh, strong, uh, but also takes into consideration many uh, specifics of, of the member states. And uh, well, uh, if we try to compare European Union constitutionalism and U United States constitutionalism on a federal level, uh, then I think it's important to reflect, to take, to consider the history of United States and the history of European Union as, as a union and as a union of nation states. Uh, and here it's a, it's a radical, I would say, difference between the two historic roots of the two constitutionalisms. Uh, European constitutionalism is not only a, a, a thousand years old, it's much longer, it stems from, from the history of ancient Egypt uh, uh, the, and the Egyptian civilization being taken over by the Greek and old Roman civilization. It stems from the, the, the split of the Roman uh, empire into the Eastern and, and Western part. And uh, it is here, let us see, you see now the, the Polish Lithuanian state in the, in the yellow, and you, you, you will see below the Austro-Hungarian uh, monarchy uh, or Habsburg monarchy, uh, which lasted up until 1914. Uh, there are two major empires, uh, a geostrategic, historical and cultural entities. And United States have never experienced anything like that. It was, it, it's, a, it's a short history of newly formed territories, which considered by their founding fathers to unite in order to, to be uh, uh, able to defend the territory of Northern uh, America against the colonial, and other powers of the of the time. So here I would stop. Maybe I was too long already, but there are some introductions to the maybe later. Uh, Excellent, uh, Professor Amber. Thank you. Um, I think you built a very nice bridge uh, from the past uh, to the to the present, and you have already yourself invited uh, Professor Batovic Pavlikowski also to comment on this. So, uh, Professor Batowick, now the, the floor is yours. And in the meantime, His Excellency has rejoined us. Uh, so we will be able to, to also to continue with three speakers as initially planned, which is also uh, very good news. In the second round, uh, you are invited to be uh, a little bit more succinct. Uh, but anyhow, Professor Batowick, uh, the floor uh, is now again yours. Oh, thank you. And I have listened uh, with great uh, interest, uh, if a little trepidation, to the uh, comments of uh, Professor Jambrek. I can hardly sort of take on such a renowned uh, modern constitutionalist uh, in his uh, in his own areas of uh, of expertise. In particular, I had better not comment on the politics of the current disputes both within Poland and between the Polish government and the uh, European Union. 
except possibly to observe that the growth uh, and the ratchet effect of the uh, Court of Justice of the European uh, Union has been causing concern, not only to the uh, proverbially independent British, uh, but also in many countries for, uh, for many years. But that's not the same thing as the essence of the, of the current dispute. Now, I was challenged almost immediately, uh, Professor Jambrek, by uh, the uh, belief that the constitution of the 3rd of May was never implemented. It was implemented and it was in force for 15 months or so. Now, 15 months may not sound very much, but nevertheless, during the sort of miraculous year that followed the, uh, the acclamation of the Constitution of the 3rd of May, the great majority of the reformed institutions that were envisaged by the Constitution were in fact established. There was the opportunity for a new kind of politics to bed down, uh, which was marked by a far greater degree of trust and harmony uh, than it had uh, prevailed hitherto. There was the opportunity for burghers and nobles to sort of fraternize with each other and for some of those social barriers uh, to break down. And there was the opportunity for the nobility gathered at its local assemblies or SAMIX uh, to uh, vote thanks or to make pledges or to swear oaths to defend the constitution. Not a single local assembly criticized the constitution and 90% of them in one way or another pledged their support. And that support was particularly strong in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, possibly as a result of the reiteration of the status of the Grand Duchy in a subsequent law passed in October uh, 1791 known as the, the Mutual Pledge. Now, you can still say that, okay, so it was implemented and it looked good, but it was only 15 months. Uh, my response there is that it's a bit more than a what you call a writer's constitution. Now, in your particular case, your wonderful constitution did in fact have an unexpected and wonderful afterlife. Uh, but the constitution of the 3rd of May was not one of those that was written and then sort of was simply put away. A candidate for that might be something even earlier than the Corsican constitution, and those are the pacts of the Zaporozhian army with its leader, uh, uh, written by Pilip Orlik in 1710, but then that really was a document created in exile that was uh, never actually uh, uh, Im implemented at all. Why I think this matters is because there is a perception that the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a failed state, that it was ruled by an anarchic and oppressive nobility uh, that was superstitious and fanatical, and that in the end, three better governed neighbors, the Russian Empire, the Kingdom of Prussia, and the Habsburg monarchy, put this failed state out of its misery uh, through the second and third partitions. Uh, and in its place came Ordnung, uh, uh, order, uh, uh, and the supposed uh, sort of rule of law, and the imposition of civilizational progress, such as compulsory fire insurance and numbered houses, the sort of things that sort of Habsburg and Hohenzollern bureaucrats uh, delighted in. Well, I think we've moved on from the idea that the path of progress leads necessarily through absolute monarchy. Uh, this uh, could lead us to the idea that, uh, that things like toleration, the rule of law, democracy, uh, liberal ideas of individual freedom and security of property are all imports from the West and that they came to Central and still later to Eastern Europe uh, as rather shallow and late imports, and that the region never produced anything of value uh, that has had a lasting impact. 
What the constitution of the 3rd of May, uh, and more generally the success of the reform movement in the late 18th century Commonwealth shows us, is that it was possible to reverse a decline uh, that left to itself, without the dead hand of the Russian protectorate, the Commonwealth was capable of setting its own course towards solutions that would prove to be sort of quite typical of the 19th centuries. For example, the division between active and passive citizens based on their property and education. It's a very 19th century way of approaching things. And this was the vision in particular of the radical reformer, the Reverend uh, Hugo uh, Kowantai. This was the sort of the trajectory that the Commonwealth was on, had it not been so rudely interrupted. But of course, it was rudely interrupted by the partitions, and therefore a great deal of 19th and 20th century Polish history ended up in the form of sort of romantic risings, uh, and perhaps in the less than entirely parliamentary democratic approach to rulership shown by uh, uh, Józef Piłsudski and Roman Domowski uh, and others uh, in the interwar period. Uh, but nevertheless, that tradition of sort of evolutionary social and political reform initiated by the constitution of the 3rd of May has never entirely uh, gone away. And it, I think it provides a, an important uh, lesson uh, for the future. You also raise the question of comparisons between the European Union and the United States of America in terms of the relationship between the states and the Union, uh, and, and whether this is federal or non-federal. Well, there are certain lessons, not so much, I think, from the Constitution of the 3rd of May, but more generally from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, in that this was a voluntary union between different political communities who while retaining their own identities, nevertheless agreed to share certain uh, institutions. And with time, they came to share a common civic uh, culture uh, as well. And even the liberal veto, which was so deservedly abolished uh, by the constitution of the 3rd of May, originally had its sense in that given the diversity of the communities, the extent of the territory, which you kindly showed everyone uh, on that map, uh, it was important that you simply didn't have majority rule of the counting votes and a majority uh, uh, imposing its will on all the rest, but you had uh, a tendency to negotiate solutions, to thrash out uh, compromises. The Polish expression for this is ucierania as gody. Now, it's a sort of thing that actually is well uh, 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 used in the European Union. That is how the European Union, on the whole, goes about making its decisions. It negotiates those decisions. And even on those occasions when it does put things to a vote, it has various complicated mechanisms for working out uh, those votes. And there is still a role for the national uh, veto. Perhaps there'll come a time in future when it's possible to, ah, oh, here we have another view of the, uh, uh, of the events on the 3rd of May, 1795, very similar to the one I showed, except this one uh, is in color. Uh, and this shows a wider view of the, of the Polish-Lithuanian uh, parliament. So the, there is, I think, a wider lesson to be drawn of how unions can work. The Polish-Lithuanian Union, which was always more than a mere dynastic union, even before 1569, lasted in total for 409 years. That is almost as long as the Anglo-Scottish uh, Union, uh, with the Union of the Crown starting in 1603, then the Union of Parliament 1707. Well, perhaps the Anglo-Scottish Union won't last for much longer. Uh, but 409 years is a respectable length of time, and I think there could be sort of lessons from that. Anyway, I've probably said enough for the moment. Thank you very much, Professor Butterwick. Polikowski, um, you, you put a, uh, an excellent question on the table. So how can unions actually work? How can, how can unions function, different unions uh, across uh, centuries, as you also described? I'd now use the opportunity to bring back uh, His Excellency, 
Your Excellency, you mentioned in your speech, uh, you raised two important uh, constitutional values, especially in, in, in federations, in federal unions, not necessarily federal states, but in, in all entities that somehow draw together different particular parts. And you have referred to the importance of autonomy of the nation and the importance of the consensus that uh, whatever happens to that nation, uh, it is subject to its consensus uh, to begin with. Uh, and to build a bridge again to the, to the present and also to the contemporary state of the European uh, Union, uh, I was wondering, do you have as a also as a representative of the of the Polish uh, state in the European Union an impression that the European Union has start presenting too much of a straitjacket uh, for Poland and that it, it is limiting its autonomy uh, it is doing something without its uh, consensus if I put it um, uh, as bluntly and what would be a solution to this problem, if there is such a problem in the first place. Um, if you, if you would, if you would like to comment on the on this question of mine, please. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Obele. Uh, I mean, the, the general prospect of this uh, uh, it was uh, was drawn uh, a little bit by by Professor uh, Patrick Pawlikowski just a while ago. Uh, but I would like to uh, to put um, your attention on a, on a one very important element of the uh, political culture of, uh, of ancient Poland, which has also uh, reflecting uh, very much on the political culture of the, of, of the present Poland. So this very uh, big conviction, very important co conviction that, uh, I mean, all people must be equal. So the essence uh, essence of the uh, of the Polish parliamentarism, of the uh, of the essence of the of the Polish Lithuanian Republic, uh, because we must uh, just remember that this state state was a republican one, and uh, this republicanism was the was the essence uh, of of its political foundations uh, was that uh, I mean equal with equals. Uh, and the, the free people with the free people. So the, nothing has changed from, from the time uh, when Poles are thinking about the, I mean, the, the relations uh, the inside the Union, uh, inside any, any kind of the, of, of the political of, of, of the political of, of, I mean, connections. Uh, for for this, practically uh, the, the 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 element the, which we are uh, thinking is the is the most important is the is the consensus. So bringing the the element of the, of the consensus and of the conviction that everyone is uh, is equal uh, with the others, which was very very uh, difficult in the ancient Poland because between uh, deputies to the parliament, deputies to the same, we had uh, just a small nobility, uh, which from time to time uh, uh, owned nothing, and uh, big magnets, big uh, people uh, who were owning uh, several uh, towns, and they were uh, like, a, uh, like a princess, uh, for, for, I mean, for, in the, in the terms of the of the uh, European uh, conditions, but they were all absolutely absolutely equal, and this equality uh, is uh, is very important uh, and, and fundamental right now. Also, when uh, European Union is trying to uh, to make the, the foreign politics, uh, we we experimented it just in the uh, in the past days. Uh, how important uh, is it, and how much uh, I mean, the Polish uh, citizens are, are sensible on it, and how much many other European uh, uh, citizens are sensible on, on this particular of, uh, equality. Uh, so, for here for, uh, was mentioned for, uh, from time to time the, the question of the, of the rule of law. 
So when we are talking about um, constitutionalism uh, in Poland and in general in Central Europe, the fact that the courts were absolutely independent from the uh, royal power and uh, the, the, the rule of law, uh, so the justice, uh, the uh, serving the justice uh, was the fundamental fundamental idea uh, for the political nation. Uh, of, uh, I mean, it 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 means that uh, this element is absolutely crucial for all of us. Also, also right uh, right now. Uh, then I would like. It was mentioned also the the uh, the connection between the EU and the, and the USA and the, and so on. Uh, I would like to to uh, uh, remember to Professor uh, uh, Bathwick and to Professor Yambrek, uh, the, the the political writer from the from the uh, late uh, 16th century, uh, Laurentius Goslitsky, uh, Grimalius who wrote an uh, incredible book, De Senatore Perfetto, uh, The Perfect Senator, uh, which was then translated into English and uh, during the uh, English Revolution uh, was, the, was this uh, very, was, was the very much, uh, was very much, uh, uh, yeah, that's it, uh, was, was very much uh, uh, read and, and was very much, uh, 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 the source of the of the inspiration, but then after all, it was the, the this particular book and his thoughts uh, was uh, were also the inspiration for the fathers of the American Constitution, and that's very important, very important parallel uh, between the uh, I mean, Polish republicanism uh, of the, the 16th, 18th century. And the American republicanism of the uh, of the early stage of the United States, and in general of the, uh, the American American uh, democratism. Uh, so uh, this is the the very important element which is linking uh, Poland with the America, and which making us to think about European Union as a uh, Republican project. So we are uh, trying to put apart uh, this uh, any, 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 any kind of the, uh, of the idea that the European U Union uh, would be not a democratic and Republican entity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, we, we are Slowly running out of time, um, I, I'd like now to um, to return to the discussion with uh, with Professor uh, Jambrek. We have one question also in the chat about the degeneration, not just uh, about the degeneration of unions, uh, but also of degeneration of constitutional democracies uh, in general. That is the constitutional democracies that draw on this um, con European constitutional heritage that has been now mentioned time and again, um, autonomy of individuals, uh, equality of individuals, freedom of individuals, also sovereign equality of states, the importance of consensus thereof, especially in federal unions. Uh, so Professor Jambrick, since you, you I, I know it's of your great interest, this uh, constitutional clashes uh, between European, uh, European court and the national highest constitutional courts, what's your opinion? How to get how to get around this problem when uh, major disagreements uh, emerge uh, between uh, the the entities in a federation and the national uh, and the federal uh, level, so that the union doesn't degenerate. What do, what do they experience? The constitutional heritage. What what kind of resources can we draw from the constitutional heritage, uh, European as well as uh, Western? Uh, to resolve this kind of uh, disputes when it seems that sometimes for some countries, the European Union has become too much of a straight, straight jacket. What would be a solution if we are now moving a little bit more to, to the future from the past to the present and now to the future? Professor Damrek, I know it's, it's, not an easy, it's, it's, it's not an easy question. It's also not something that can be responded to in, in five minutes, but please, the floor is yours. Mr. Howard, I can respond it in, in, in not in one, 
one sentence in one word? My answer is facts. Solution is respect of facts, empirical state of affairs. And then if you master uh, enough of authentic, well-assembled facts, then it's the, the matter of logic, the argument, legal argument, philosophical argument, so forth. So that is the basis. Mediation and compromises are uh, end result of, of this kind of uh, <clears throat> mindset starting with the facts. Now, uh, if you ask me more specific question, if you remember, uh, we, uh, and I both uh, we remember our very, I would say, gentle dispute about the competencies of the uh, European Union Court of Justice. Here, it seems beyond a doubt that this court, which is so important for all the member states uh, and uh, their interpretation of what powers they comfort to the European Union, that this court is assuming in itself, by itself, its own competencies. So in the German word, uh, we both know very well, there is a formula competence, competence. And there are uh, courts and other bodies, uh, international and nation state bodies, which tend to assume and define by their, themselves their own competencies. Supreme Court of the United States does it, uh, has done it uh, in, a, in a very, I would say, prudent way from its beginning when it assumed its role of a constitutional court, not only Supreme Court of the nation. And the European Union Court seems to take the lead, the, the following follows the example of the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, I developed an argument that uh, it, the competence, competence formula acts and has different effects uh, in a federation, a federation being a sovereign state and a union uh, whose founding uh, base is not a constitution which constitutes a nation, but a treaty, two treaties. And these treaties are voluntarily signed by member states. So would the European Court of Justice have a legitimate or even legal right, according to the international law principles, to assume its own competencies, as it does, obviously, nowadays, also in the Polish case, very, very uh, precisely. So here, I remember you answered my question. <laughs> when there is a conflict of competencies, competence, competence, in the end, it's not solved by legal means, it's solved by a power play in political sphere. And here, may I add, end my, my answer to your question by uh, this chart. You see the red line, the red line cutting Europe from north to south, from Riga to Budva in Montenegro. It's very well known north-south divide, which was also not only described by Samuel Huntington in his Clash of Civilizations. It's, uh, it's for us in Slovenia, for the Balkans, it's very well known that this divide follows the old divide between Eastern and Western Roman Empire. Uh, and it was drawn in fifth, sixth, seventh century by Diocletian, but it also follows the divide between the Greek, ancient Greek colonization and the Western Roman part of the empire. So, and this divide goes along the Riva Dreamer, Dream, uh, River to Danube, along the Carpathi and north uh, to the north, where it meets 
much later drawn uh, divide, which uh, here <laughs> I would ask uh, my fellow professional historian could to correct me, drawn by the Grunewald uh, battle in 1410 where and when the Polish, Lithuanian and allied forces uh, defeated the Teutonic uh, League of, of, of mainly German uh, kind of, uh, of armies assembled at that time. <clears throat> this major battle of the Middle, Cent uh, middle <coughs> Ages defined <coughs> the, the northern part of this North-South European divide. <coughs> now, Huntington stated that the eastern part uh, the, to, the, to, to the east of this divide uh, marks the division between orthodoxy and Western Christianity. But somehow Samuel Huntington was not interested enough he did touch upon the di internal division of Western Europe as well. But nowadays, for, for us, member states of European Union, uh, uh, forgetting the United Kingdom, which is happily exited of the European Union and is now on the side of commentaries uh, uh, in favor of the Polish dispute over, over its judgment. So, <laughs> Here, the divide is actually not Northwestern line, but a chain of nations from Latvia, Lit Lithuania, Poland, Czech, Slovak, parts, the Catholic parts of Ukraine, uh, getting down to Hungary, Austria, Slovenia, Croatia. So what do we, do we see? We, uh, we see uh, on the west of the divide, a chain of Catholic countries, Catholic. And on the West, they are Protestants. On the East, they are Orthodox. But somehow the chain is divided by this old historic Catholicism versus Orthodoxy and Protestantism uh, battles, which defined the history of the Middle Ages. Of course, the Catholicism is not anymore a powerful factor in our countries. The Czech, for example, believe in Catholicism only by 18%. They're they are mostly atheist or agnostics. But we know from the Slovenian experience, even if you are not a Catholic, you, you, your family upbring, uh, the, uh, education follows the century long uh, teachings of the Ten Commandments uh, taught, taught by the Catholic Church. So anyway, <laughs> You see here, uh, I would correct Mr. Butterwick that the Polish-Lithuanian Empire Commonwealth, as you say uh, correctly, didn't last only 409 years. It lasted from the Grunewald uh, battle in 1410 until nowadays, when we have, for example, revival of the Visegrad uh, Agreement uh, in the 14th century uh, by the four countries, uh, Czech, Poland, Slovak, and Hungary, and now extending a little bit to the north and extending a little bit to the south. And it's still an enduring regional uh, commonwealth, very informal, uh, which uh, nowadays becomes also an actor, a power player within the European Union. And that is, I would say, geopolitical, cultural, and historic background to the very urgent uh, disputes uh, originated, uh, originating by the Polish uh, judge, Constitutional Tribunal judgment of October 21. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor, Professor Jambrek. I think that unfortunately we have a run out, a run out of time. Uh, the, the next lectures at the new university will be starting uh, shortly, but we have within this uh, debate over an hour and a half, traveled this long historical arc from the, uh, from the middle ages um, to, uh, to the present. 
uh, we have um, closely and carefully debated the elements of the European uh, constitutional heritage as expressed uh, here in, in Central Eastern Europe, in particular on the examples of uh, Poland and uh, Slovenia. Uh, the, the, the foundational elements of this constitutional heritage that we have referred to were, again, those that built, uh, the, that present the cornerstones of contemporary constitutional uh, democracies. This is the autonomy of the individuals, uh, their freedom uh, and equality, their right uh, to live in a, in a polity uh, which is uh, autonomous um, of a nation that has uh, self-determination. Uh, and the nation, when it gives and reaches its consensus, of course, it can also transfer uh, some of its competences to broader uh, federal frameworks, supranational unions, such as the European uh, Union uh, is. Uh, I was very happy uh, to have learned more about the, uh, the Polish constitution of the 3rd of May of, of 1791. Uh, I was also very happy to learn about its uh, contemporary uh, resonance. Uh, and I think the, the entire debate uh, maybe paved already the path to the next debate, which is not just about, because the constitutional heritage, heritage is just but, just but one reflection of a broader cultural heritage that at the end you, Professor Jambrek, uh, referred to. So I'm grateful to all the three speakers uh, for having uh, participated, have, having shared uh, their thoughts with us today, especially to Professor uh, Batowicz Pawlikowski from Cambridge, uh, Professor Jambre from the university, and of course, uh, uh, last but certainly not uh, least, um, His Excellency Krzysztof Olenski, uh, who kindly agreed uh, that we host today's session together. It was my great honor uh, to have organized, co-organized this uh, event today, this academic forum, uh, together with our friends at the Polish Embassy. I'm looking forward to our further uh, collaboration. I, I'm thanking to all of you again for having participated, also to our audience for having uh, for having bared, uh, bared with us. Uh, and now I'm already directing my uh, colleagues, students to the to the to the lecture room. But thank you very well, very much again, and hoping to see you soon, uh, and hopefully also in person. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.